Greetings, my name is Emir Wekferson, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the stuff that I research. So I effectively wear three hats, ranging from distributed systems, how do you get millions of computers to work in syncopation together and do something. I work in security, specifically on security education. How do you make something safer by educating people about how it goes wrong? And I work in data science, specifically on surveillance of various diseases like influenza and malaria. Let me start by looking at the distributed systems research that I do. And a question that has fascinated me for a long time is, how do you get the same data to multiple parts, ideally at the same time, with consistency and security and scalability? What happens when things are really big? Because you see, if you just try to store a lot of data, like suppose you're Facebook or you're YouTube, and you just want to store everything on hard disks. Well, what happens when you have billions and billions of clients? And we're talking about this, this billions of clients. We're talking about billions of requests per second. Yes, what happens is that the whole thing melts down presently. So how do you circumvent that? Well, as it turns out, people have been putting a copy of these photos and videos and friends list and everything into commonly accessed data on special machines that have only an internal memory. And these are called caches. So it's a caching layer, right? Now, What's very important is what you put in those caches. You will eventually run out of space because memory is expensive and it's small compared to the hard disk. So you have to put the right things in. Now we're doing here a lot of work on trying to predict what items are going to be useful in the future and focus on storing them in the memory. It's a really old problem, but it's actually understudied in modern settings because things have changed so much in the past 10, 20 years about the workloads that caches undergo. And also, we have millions and millions of dollars and hundreds of millions of computers that are riding on a good solution. So we're doing a lot of work on trying to predict what items will be important in the future and focus on storing those in memory. We're also trying to figure out how much memory you really use. Here's a curve that, for instance, we can create for you on the fly. If we think about trying to predict what is going to be used, there are millions of dollars riding on a good solution. Our methods for predicting video popularity are now actually used by Facebook to improve their site. The second hat that I wear relates to big data or data science or whatever you want to call it. And it pertains to particular real world objectives. Specifically, one of our projects, we use cell phone metadata that is routinely collected by cell phone companies just to do billing to try to infer people's behavior and from that routine. And what I mean, what I mean by behavior is you were at that cell phone tower at that point and then you are at a different point at a different time, and that one of them is possibly work, one of them is home. You can see deviations from this routine, and if you see deviations, then maybe you can infer when you're sick. So we're using artificial intelligence to try to detect those deviations from behavior so that we can model to possibly get an understanding of possible epidemic outbreaks in real time. Now, the current methods that we have for epidemic surveillance are pretty slow, and they're not very accurate. So here's an example from a data set that we have where people with H1N1 influenza drops markedly after the onset that happens here at day zero. So day zero is when they actually got sick, and this is the aggregate movement here in the wires. Remember, it's all anonymous. And we're using deep learning to try to detect more of these diseases. Our goal is that these methods can be used for surveillance in a wide variety of diseases and epidemics, and it can be used in lower and middle income countries. And a month ago, we got an award from the CDC to use some methods to try to improve malaria surveillance. We're using Bayesian optimization to try to figure out when you have multiple strains of malaria at once, which happens all the time, how can you actually detect that? Because we don't really have the biological tools for doing so, not that are affordable. So it turns out that math and data science can actually help us out. Now, the third path that I have is tackling security questions. And the particular questions that we're looking at from a research angle is trying to detect hackers that are already in your network. Because let's face it, your outer perimeter is the first thing that falls, and it's the simplest thing to get through. So the question is, once a hacker is out of your network, what can they do? Now here at Emory, we have a lot of work that's happening. We're teaching courses on, on hacking. We have international security competitions that we're hosting and taking part in. I co-founded a company called Synthes that does penetration testing, so we have inside knowledge into how it is that things get broken. Um, our lectures are broadcast online, we give talks around the world. We have a lot of knowledge about how to do security education, and we do it from the vantage point of trying to understand how the attacker behaves. Because if we understand how things break, it's much easier for us to try to play defense. 
you do with defense, you're trying to prove a negative. You're trying to figure out all the possible ways somebody might get inside. And consequently, if you understand the mindset, you can be more adaptive and you can have a lot more permanent knowledge about this cat and mouse game that plays in the security industry. How do you best teach security and hacking at scale? There are all sorts of interesting educational questions that come here. We're trying to build a platform that allows pretty much anybody to get training for security. What data features are that really that predict network competence? And this is a big question, trying to gather all the different kinds of logs and information that exist from various different systems in the network to try to predict this lurking behavior that can happen, go under the radar when you have an enemy inside the network. It's trying to move around, move laterally to try to reach a particular target. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I look forward to hearing from you.